In the 1600s, Newton published his Laws of Motion. Many are familiar with his second law. That force is equal to mass times acceleration. But what is the equivalent in general relativity? The answer will let us understand why the planet Mercury precesses the way it does. This is one of the tests that showed the effectiveness of Einstein's theory. Let us start by writing Newton's second law. That is, if an object of mass m has a force applied to it, its acceleration will be given by the force divided by the mass. If we plot the position versus time of the object, it should make a parabola. But what if the force acting on the body was zero? Then, the position versus time graph would be a straight line. This makes sense because this would correspond to a constant velocity. Let us rewrite the force equation in terms of differentials and introduce one of the most important equations in general relativity, the geodesic equation. I will argue that this equation can be thought of as the generalization of Newton's second law in the case that f equals zero to curved spacetime. We can already see some similarities to Newton's law, such as this second derivative term. We will return back to this later. We first need to know what this capital gamma term is. These are the Christoffel symbols. It is an array of numbers that tell you how your basis vectors are changing. It allows us to define the concept of parallel transport. Suppose we had a curved surface like a sphere, and we had a tangent vector pointing strictly in the positive z direction. One can parallel transport this vector all the way up to the top. If we have an identical vector at the same position and transport it along the equator, keeping it tangent to the sphere, and then just like the first vector, we transport it up to the top, we can see that these two vectors are now pointing in different directions. So this means the result of parallel transporting depends on the path taken. This is only true on a curved space. If we had flat space, such as the standard Cartesian coordinate system, then the result is independent on the path taken. Now we can return back to Newton's law and the geodesic equation. I want to make some very important points. The Christoffel symbols themselves do not indicate that there is curvature present. One can have perfectly flat space, but use a coordinate system where the basis vectors change. The polar coordinate system is a good example. The Christoffel symbols are not all zero in this coordinate system because the unit vectors r hat and theta hat are different at different points. In flat space, even if one chooses a coordinate in which the Christoffel symbols are non-zero, it is still possible to change to a coordinate system in which the symbols vanish everywhere. This is not true in curved space. But for now, we will assume we are in flat space and choose a coordinate system in which the symbols are zero everywhere, like Cartesian coordinates. Our next task is to figure out what this mu symbol means. It is not an exponent. Mu is an index that labels certain coordinates. It can range from zero to three. Mu zero is taken to be the time coordinate, and mu one, two, and three are taken to be the three spatial coordinates. Of course, since we are in the Cartesian system, the three spatial coordinates are x, y, and z. What you are really then seeing with this equation is actually four different equations, one for each dimension. But we can also rewrite Newton's law in this format. If we put an index i on the x, then we have three separate equations for the force, one for each direction. Of course, we can't have i equals zero. Newton's law only applies to the spatial directions. Now we get to the lambda term. This is an affine parameter. An affine parameter is one which keeps the geodesic equation in its usual form that was showed earlier. For particles with mass, it is usually taken to be the proper time, which is the time experienced by the particle itself. For a massless particle, we cannot use proper time as massless particles do not experience time, so one must choose another parameter. These two equations now are nearly identical. They both reduce to equations of straight lines when no forces are present. But what is a geodesic? 
Just as in flat space we have straight lines, a geodesic is the generalization of a straight line to curved space. It is the path of a particle that is free from all external non-gravitational forces. Now we will put the geodesic equation to work by examining the path of the planet Mercury around the Sun. For that we need to use the full geodesic equation. We also need to use the Schwarzschild metric. We discussed this in more detail in the previous video. In short, it is the line element around an uncharged, non-rotating, spherical body. The Sun is rotating and is not perfectly spherical, but this should not matter too much. Rs is the Schwarzschild radius of the Sun, which is the radius the Sun needs to be compacted to, to form a black hole. R is the radial coordinate. It can take any value greater than the radius of the object because this is a vacuum solution. In the previous video, we were only concerned with the radial part of this equation, so we had set the angular part d omega to zero. Since we are now examining the orbit of a planet around a star, we cannot ignore this part. With this metric, we can compute the Christoffel symbols we had previously mentioned and find the geodesic equation for each value of mu. Since we are now in spherical coordinates, we have r, theta, and phi instead of x, y, and z. That gives four coupled second-order differential equations. It seems like solving these equations is going to be impossible, but we can use some tricks. The easiest way is to use killing vectors and symmetries. Do not be fooled by the simplicity of this equation. It is very tedious to solve. In 4D spacetime, this is actually 10 partial differential equations. Killing vectors are vectors which satisfy this equation. The reason why we want to find killing vectors is because they each correspond to a conserved quantity. To find them, one can actually solve Killing's equation, or more commonly, one can use the symmetries of the problem. We will, of course, do the latter. Remember that our problem of a planet orbiting a star is one that has a high degree of symmetry. We can choose a coordinate system in which our planet is orbiting in the equatorial plane. If that is the case, then we have a rotational symmetry about an axis. If our planet is not in this plane, then we can rotate our coordinates until it is. This means we have rotational symmetry around all three axes. Now that we have identified some symmetries, we need to get the killing vectors. For that, let us go back to the Schwarzschild metric. Here we have now written out the angular part explicitly. We can see that our metric is independent of the coordinate phi. There is d phi squared, but not a regular phi. This corresponds to the symmetry about one of the axes. Our killing vector is simply the phi basis vector. Our metric is also independent of the coordinate t. That is, if we wait some time, our line element will be the same. This gives our second killing vector, which is just the time basis vector. I said earlier that each killing vector corresponds to a conserved quantity. The phi killing vector gives conservation of angular momentum, and the time killing vector gives conservation of energy. Mathematically, we can substitute our killing vectors into the top equation and set the constants as E for energy and L for angular momentum. The second equation is equal to a number, epsilon. This number is plus one for particles with mass. If we get the constants from the top equation and use the Schwarzschild metric in the bottom equation, we will get an equation of the following form. Now we can recognize something. If we slightly rewrite this equation by multiplying by half, taking the e to the other side and multiplying out the brackets, this looks like we have a radial kinetic energy term, a potential energy term, and a total energy term. Let us examine the potential. The first term is just a constant. This won't matter too much. The second term is just the standard gravitational potential in Newtonian gravity. The third term is the centrifugal term. The fourth term is the contribution from general relativity. Let us take the negative gradient to get the force. Here we have restored the factors of C to make this dimensionally correct. The angular momentum term L here is angular momentum per unit mass, 
sometimes called the specific angular momentum. The centrifugal term was emitted because this will be plotted in an inertial reference frame. The centrifugal term is included in the tangent velocity vector. First, I will show Mercury's orbit in standard Newtonian gravity. Here, the eccentricity is exaggerated for demonstration purposes. You can see that the perihelion will not precess. Now the full general relativistic orbit. I will make some concluding remarks while this plays. The precession rate here is also exaggerated for demonstration purposes. Since the general relativistic term goes as 1 over r to the fourth, this term gets more important as one gets closer to the gravitational source. The solution we found is also an exact solution, not a power series. We assumed the planet Mercury is a test particle, which means that it has no effect on the gravitational field itself. Of course, in reality, this is never true. The two bodies in isolation will orbit their center of mass. If we included all the other planets, the center of mass of the system would lie outside the Sun. The other planets would also have their own gravitational influence on Mercury as well. How can one understand the reason for the perihelion shift? If we had an elliptical orbit in Newtonian gravity, the potential, as we saw, goes as 1 over r. Bertrand's theorem says that among central force potentials, 1 over r produces a closed orbit. That is, that the orbit will return to its starting point after a finite angle. The trajectory repeats exactly. When we added the general relativistic term, the potential was no longer perfectly 1 over r. This means that we won't have a closed orbit anymore, so the perihelion should precess. One can also plot the potential for different L values to see the kinds of orbit possible. Thanks for watching. Check out the previous video for a better understanding of the line element.